welcome to Are You Ready Australia? The Future of Indigenous Leadership in Australian Higher Education, a conference developed by POSH SANNT and facilitated by Campus Morning Mail and Tweak Marketing. I'm Tim Winkler and we'll be facilitating the session alongside conference chair, the director of POSH SANNT, Marie Meredith. Firstly, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we each live and work today, and also pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. This session is Surviving Study, the inspiration of one student's journey. It's a great privilege to have Carly James with us today. Um, when I first heard Carly's story, I thought, oh, we'll have to write about that. And then I connected with Carly on a Zoom chat. And um, it was just the one slot in Carly's day that managed to fit in, in between her studying to be a, a doctor, she's a medical student now, almost finished, and feeding kids. She was chopping vegetables, giving instructions <laughs> on how the food should be cooked, and at the same time, answering questions in a calm and logical way. And I thought, Wow, if I ever really need a doctor in a crisis, this is the person who I need to go to. Um, so Carly, it'd be great. Can we start off with um, a little bit about you? Um, where did you grow up? Um, so uh, hi, hi everyone. Um, so yes, my name is Carly and I'm a proud Ghana, Kana Yorta Yorta and Kaku Jangden woman. Um, so I grew up, so my mob are actually from Queensland and Victoria, but I grew up in Catherine. Um, which is, for those that don't know, it's a small town about three hours out of Darwin. Um, so I've spent half my life there and half my life in Darwin. So, um, yeah, I was practically brought up in the Northern Territory. So you went to school and you, you thought, well, maybe I'll have a gap year. You enjoyed, you enjoyed school well enough, but then there was time to, um, to do a, a gap year. Yes, yeah, so I went to school and then I wanted to go to university, um, but then I had a gap year which extended out to a 12 year gap year. Um, in that time, I had my family and then I still had that uh, really strong desire to, to study. Um, and sorry, my son's in the background. Um, yeah, so I thought uh, I'll go for it now and then I uh, decided to enroll. And it's very appropriate that your son's in the background because really it's a big part of your life story that you had the gap year and then you decided to enrol. Now, I remember you said when you first started studying, you would balance your textbooks sort of between the crib and so on in a, in a small setting up your own small study space. Yeah, that's right. So uh, I started studying. So I enrolled gun ho. I was turning 30. And I thought it's either now or never. Um, and I enrolled into a Bachelor of Biomedical Science through Charles Darwin University here in Darwin. Um, and there was, so the science degree at the time was offered external. And I was just having a little look online um, while I was pregnant with Jacob, my third son. Yeah, my third son, <laughs> so I had to think about that. Um, and then I thought, oh, I just, I really want to get, give it a go. Um, and yeah, so I enrolled and then uh, it full time. So when he was born uh, in December, I was ready to rock and roll in February. So he was three months old. Um, so I did it external while I, while I was at home um, on some maternity leave. Just I thought, see how I go. Um, why not? At the time, obviously, I wasn't as confident as I am now, but I thought I just want to, yeah, I just want to. I had this really strong desire to be to to get educated. Yeah. Why, why was that though, Carly? Because you'd been working full time, then you'd been a you know been a mum full time on on maternity leave here and there. You were doing a whole lot, holding a, a family together on your own. How did how did you? What drove you to think? Well, studying's for me. Well, at first, like I always had that in the back of my mind in my little. Um, draft life plan I was like yes at some stage I'm going to fit in like a four or five year degree um, in between studying uh, working sorry and um, having the kids but then I just was never in a position to and I think as an Indigenous woman growing up and I've shared this in other 
uh, on other platforms. But I think that it wasn't as encouraging back when I was in high school. And, and that really left an imprint, I think, on my um, confidence, I guess, and the desires to, to go any further, like to pursue tertiary education. And then it wasn't until like I got that little bit of confidence in the workforce, um, even from being a parent, a little bit of life experience. And I thought, you know what, I'm just going to do it. Um, and then, yeah, and I remember at the time thinking, and uh, the kid's dad was like, oh, look, I think, because I'd rolled full time, just straight up, like never studied before. And then he's like, I think you should um, maybe just, you know, like study part time. So anyway, I dropped a unit. So I was still technically full-time, 75%. Um, and then, yeah, and then I did really well. So I was like, wow. And then I, I ended up squeezing in the extra units um, into like summer semester and stuff so I could complete the degree on time. Um, but my goal, like I was super ambitious at the time, um, was to try and get into medicine if I could. And then my plan B was to... Um, was pathology but I've always had an interest in science um, and I was surprised because I've talked to a few like younger Indigenous students and I'm surprised and super uh, excited that that there is this passion for science and I think I think it's like maybe yeah, it would be amazing to see more younger like Indigenous scientists um, uh, or professionals in general but um, yeah because I thought it's science is not an area that a lot of people that people are interested in but you'd be surprised I think people might think oh it's too hard or um, not achievable but it definitely is yeah. So you love science but you could have been an astronaut or a physicist why uh, why oh no not, head not down, physics. Why, why head down to become a doctor why why did that why did that interest you? And was it a sort of a dare to dream moment to just actually tell people I want to be a doctor? Yeah, well, that's the thing. When I enrolled into my science degree, there was no way I was, the word doctor was coming out of my mouth. People were like, oh, what are you going to do with that? And I was like, um, I'm going to try and get a job in the labs. And they're like, wow. And even that was really cool for people. And they're like, really? And I said, yeah. I said, I love looking at cells. I love everything about, you know, laboratory. Um, and it's just, yeah, then something that like not everyone does. So I thought it'd be really cool to, um, but yeah, I would never say, oh, I'm actually going to see if I can get into medicine. It wasn't until towards the end of the degree that I started saying oh, to my close friends and family, oh, I've applied for medicine through Flinders. You know, I've got, I had really good, surprisingly grades. So um, yeah, so I was like, yeah. And that's when I started telling people that that's what I wanted to do. Um, but I think, I think my drive to do medicine now as an older student is to give back to communities in a way where I think like the health, like you see our mob suffer so bad and you think like, so, like because I worked in legal and then now I'm in health. In legal, I thought I could make change with like in like youth and um, younger mob out in community. But then, yeah, I don't know. And then I just sort of thought about I went into a clinic one day on the out bush and and I seen one of the nurses and I thought um there was no and the one thing I noticed because I was going out just I was happy to be out there for work was there was no indigenous staff in the clinic and I not like no indigenous work uh nurses um I didn't see any um health workers or anything I thought wow like yeah how amazing would it be to 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 start some sort of change, especially up here, because we do have quite remote communities in the territory. So yeah, so it's one of the so reasons. You've, so you've got a dream, and you're mm -hmm. almost through your um, first degree, and then um, uh, Jacob was diagnosed. Yes. So then that um, yeah. So then when I was um, coming up to my last year in my undergrad in my science degree um my then two-year-old son he was sick and diagnosed um with acute leukemia so that was um yeah life-changing um and then we had to relocate to Adelaide for 
for potentially life saving treatment for him. Um, so myself, the whole family, we had to go down and we stayed in Adelaide for 15 months while he underwent treatment. Um, and then I had my mum, my mum flew down when he first got sick and I happened to apply for med in the December. He got sick in the February and, um, and then they contacted me. They sent an email to say I got an interview and I'm standing outside Women and Children's Hospital with my mum this email's popped up on my phone. I was like, oh, I've got an interview with Flinders. And she's like, oh, that's fantastic. I said, mum, what? <laughs> so I was like, what? <laughs> and then she's like, um, she goes, are you going to do it? And I was like, um, I don't think so. And then it was actually my mum that said, she goes, you're down here. You're studying something, a, a degree that's relevant to Jacob. Um, and she goes, you've got all the doctors there that can be your informal tutors. And I was like, okay. So I just, it was, and then the whole time though, when I, we were in Adelaide, I was definitely on autopilot. Um, and I actually kept studying. So I contacted the uni, told them my situation. They were fantastic, super supportive. Um, and then, yes, yeah, so I continued studying cra crazily on the hosp hospital, by his hospital bed. So yeah, but but it was also relevant though. I, I I don't think, when I think of it, I don't believe that I would have continued if I was say studying business or accounting mm -hmm. or something, but because I was studying something so relevant, um, it actually helped me to understand what Jacob was going through. Um, so it was, I think it was a bit of advantage as a, a childhood cancer parent to have that knowledge about cells and because I did like by um I did uh biochemistry one and two um I did clinical pathology um immunology so I did all of these subjects that were just so relevant so I think that's why I was able to somehow finish my degree in that final year when he was sick yeah well, it's pretty amazing to think of you studying beside the hospital bed and, and still getting through. And then you've, right. you've, you've, you've come back, um, Jacob's going well, but um, and now you've got four kids and you're balancing all the challenges of being a mother to four kids um, and then being a new student in the medical degree. Um, and then you've done that for four years and you're, you're almost, you know, you're four weeks away from, from finishing. Um, through that, you make it sound in a, in a way quite easy, um, <laughs> even though you've been through some extraordinary, extraordinarily tough times. How many times have you thought, maybe I should give up this journey? Um, it's funny, during the, in the, the last year in Adelaide, that I probably thought of that once, um, but I just looked at Jacob and I thought, like any, anything that I was going through, like stress-wise with uni or the other children, like nothing could compare to what he was going through. And that definitely gave me that motivation to just keep going. Um, and like I said, the understanding, like it was just at the time so valuable to me. Um, just getting my head around everything because as you can imagine the complexities of uh, cancer treatment especially for children it's just yeah mind-blowing and then the, like they give you this folder like that big and they're like okay your kid's been diagnosed with cancer here's a folder take it home you know it's information overload the first few appointments um, and then all the parents would be all sort of congregating in the parent room and like running past you know like thoughts and feelings and ideas about the treatment and stuff and um and I was able to explain you know the difference between a red blood cell and a white blood cell and the different types of immune cells and things like that and then they were like oh and it was just yeah it was so good so I think that period of time med school I think I don't think I ever thought of giving up I've haven't had the a smooth um cruisy path through med uh not at all um but yeah but I just I think just I think of my kids and I think I've been studying for so long this is something that is going to set them up for their future as well and then that 
whenever I'm feeling, yeah, like I want to give up, that is my my main motivator. Oh, yeah, a thousand percent. When you say it's not a smooth, cruisy path, um, you know, what, what have been some of the challenges that you've had? And and are there particular challenges as a as an Aboriginal mature age student? Oh, where do I start? <laughs> um, yeah, I think the challenge of having children in general with any degree is there and it's very real. And um, But it's not impossible. I think people are like, I don't know how you do it. And I'm like, if you want something, you go to work every day. You like, just think of going to uni every day. If it's something that you really want, um, and then it's just exactly the same as how you would schedule your life around your kids and working full time, but you're studying full time. And then in something where you're going to end up having a job that you actually want, because I had a few jobs, like I've worked in all uh, departments of government, had a few jobs and then, um, yeah, but I was just never, it was never fulfilling. I'm thinking you spend however many hours in the day going to work, if you dedicate the those hours to studying um yeah that's it's equivalent I think um and how do you balance finances like that's something that immediately comes to mind you've gone you're talking for about full-time work obviously there's a pay packet coming in when you're a student not so many pay packets sitting around um so I think that budgeting being super organized um so having so like for med school in particular, because like I've got, a, I've applied for a few of the scholarships, which um, thankfully I received a couple. So that's always helped. So I just pay things in advance. So like insurance and rates, cause I've got a home and things like that as well. Um, yeah, so, and then the kid's dad works. So he helps out with the mortgage and things like that. Um, but I think if I was renting even, I think it's definitely still achievable. Um, I get a little bit of help from the government. Um, and then, yeah, I think the budgeting is a big deal and the meal planning as well. Um, so having exactly what you're going to eat in that fortnight, you've budgeted for that, the rest goes on this bill and just having a spreadsheet, having it all recorded. And then, yeah, and I think it's important when you're studying uh, medicine or health or science um, because it is some things are very hard I think just having that set routine of your meal planning um, even even like down to what you're going to wear so one of the doctors told me um, once he's like you know and I admit I haven't been good with the other few things but he's he said you know bring your lunch always have something that you know that you like bring that wear a uniform or wear something that you're comfortable with to work wear the same thing every day if you have to um and then and then the self-care things which I admit I haven't done <laughs> he's like so I joined the gym um that didn't last long but I had still have the membership but he said you know do the gym put that into your routine and your exercise or whatever so you're just ticking off all those things without thinking about it, it becomes part of your routine. And that way your focus is on purely on what you're studying. Um, and like for, like for med, you know, your focus is in just on the patient. You're not worrying about, oh, what am I gonna have for lunch? Or oh, do I have money for lunch? Um, or oh, do I look um, awkward in these clothes or whatever? Like you don't have to think about it. So I took that on board because I, <laughs> I have my uni shirt. And um, and I don't really like the design, but I was like, you know what? It's actually good. Everyone knows you're a student then. I don't have to explain the whole, you know, some people think I'm a consultant because I'm an older student, and which is really flattering, but I'm like, no, I'm still, I'm still the baby doctor. Um, yeah, so anyway, so putting like that, so I just wear the same skirt and top every day now. And, has, and it's surprising how much of a difference that makes. Yeah. And do you end up having to study when the kids have gone to sleep? Like, do you, do you have a round the clock study schedule? Um, in first and second year, definitely. Um, but that was more, it was very, because we were learning about everything, you know, like your anatomy and physiology and learning that in great 
greater detail. Um, so yes, yeah, so that was like, but it's not like you're studying into like sometimes you would study into like two, three o'clock in the morning if you're getting assessments done, but other times you can get a full night's sleep. I don't want to scare people off because it's definitely <laughs> achievable, but I've done a lot of study when my kids are, are asleep, yes. Um, but then clinical, because you're kind of learning on the go, on the um, on placement. So yeah, it's a little bit different. You don't have to dedicate as much time at night. Yeah. Um, and and what tell what about the benefits of being a mature age student? I remember you saying in some ways it, it, there are some benefits in that you you feel more comfortable approaching patients, for example. Yes, yeah, so I think the benefits that come with being mature aged is having that um, some patients, especially Indigenous patients, I find I have an instant rapport with with them, um, especially when I was working community or at RDH here, like our main hospital. Um, just it's an instant comfort, you know, oh, there's, and I always wear my Indigenous earrings too to work. Um, so they know, and yeah, um, so that's one thing. Um, another would be you're less, I guess, emotional with things. So um, say that the guys I'm studying with that are in their early 20s, um, they're still figuring life out. They're still figuring out, you know, um, how to get themselves up in the morning. Like a lot of them still live with mum and dad or they live with their partner, but no children. And yeah, and I, <laughs> it sort of, yeah, it sort of works both ways. Like sometimes I'm like so envious of that. I think, wow, you have, must have so much time to just study. Um, but then on the other hand, my life experience, um, I like the mama of the group, people can come to me if they, you know, and it's, um, and I think it makes you a lot more patient for your patients and you kind of can emphasize more definitely like when people and you, and you've been there, you've done that. Like you've been a, a patient yourself and, uh, or a, fam um, a, a family member who's been sick, like, especially in the indigenous community, like so many of our mob get so like critically ill, but so we can, we can emphasize with the next of kid like the family and things of the patients that's definitely an advantage um and another one would be like the things i was talking about before like budgeting um and having a routine and things like that i think that is something that you develop or well, i myself have developed as a mum. yeah and then like adjusting to you know the more kids you have the more busier you get being able to make those adjustments I'm not sure if you can do that as in my like in my early 20s there's no way I could do that so it's another advantage um, and I think um, it comes with a little bit of confidence although the younger students are quite confident um, which is you know reasonable but I find it a lot easier sometimes to talk to to um, some of the doctors and things like that or they'll come up to me and talk to me because I can be quite shy believe it or not um especially in the medical world but like just then for example I was in this watching the scopes and one of the RMOs and one of the um Indian female doctors came up and was like hey and like made sure that I they said hello like we're in theater and I was like oh hey and it was just it was so nice I was like and all of the consultants know my name at RDH, which I don't know if it, that's a good thing or a bad thing, but all of them remember my name when I'm after being on placement with them. Um, yeah, anyway, that's good. But I think they remember, because I think they do remember the, they definitely remember the black students. They definitely remember the older students. Yeah. And as part of being an, an Aboriginal, almost doctor, an Aboriginal medical student, it, what's the, what are the challenges and opportunities that come with that? Um, are there extra expectations on you and also sort of a burden of I'm responsible, there's not many of us? Um, no, I think it's a privilege. I I love the position I'm in. Um, I love talking to younger mob that asked me, you know, oh, what's it like? Or, you know, and it, as soon as a younger person asked, asked, well, not younger, any age actually, asked me what's it like so I'm straight on to it I'm like 
why have you thought about it? Because, you know, like, you know, Flinders is like, there's a local uni, because see, back before there was no local uni here, um, you know, and they're, and, or if they, you, you know, you can just tell if they're like, maybe they are thinking along those lines. Or if they're school students, I just say like, um, if you wanted to have that as an option later on, just make sure you do your sciences, even your basic science and things like that. Yeah. And your maths, if they are, if they ask, I don't want to be too put it on, you know, um, too full on about it. Um, but yeah, no, I think I enjoy, enjoy that. And I think as a student though, because we, I'm, I'm definitely so inspired by, because we have indigenous consultants here in Darwin. Um, I think it's like a first time ever. We've got like the first Dana Snape, the first uh, dermatologist. We've got Dennis Bonney, the pediatrician neo um, neonatologist. Um, we've got Counter Brown. So I think that question would be probably more for them because they, yeah, they're just, they've already, they're consultants, like it's insane and they're Aboriginal and there's there's none in a hospital. And like, we have three in our hospital, which is huge, I think, or maybe four even, anyway. Um, yeah, so at the moment, I think, yeah, I think once I do graduate, I think I'll probably feel that more, I think, yeah. You mentioned before um, imposter syndrome, and you, when you were talking about your life, you talked about your you know challenges with with confidence to feel like you can go and do the degree for a start, and then that that you can become a doctor. How has that been a challenge for you, imposter syndrome, over time? Oh, um, that was. I think the imposter syndrome kicked in when I started clinical. Um, it was fine in the classroom. Um, sometimes to certain peers, like you, cause you, it, it's such a huge issue, um, which is why I wanted to talk about that during this forum, because we are all deserving of being in, in the place that we're at, we're at. Um, there were times where I felt, definitely felt, um, imposter syndrome set in. I mean, I'm not going to lie. I think I've experienced probably worse than other indigenous the other two Indigenous students in my cohort, because I've debriefed with them and I'm, um, and just having to prove yourself um, in comparison to other students. Um, and then I think that's when it starts like, oh, you know, I'm not, um, I shouldn't be here. Like I've only got this spot because, because I know, and then you start thinking that other people are thinking that. Because straight away, sometimes when you start a placement, they're like, oh, what did you do before this? Or how did you find the GAMSAT? Like knowing I probably had an alternative pathway into medicine. Um, yeah, which is, yeah. And, um, and then that's when that sets in. But I wanted to talk about that because I think, you know, you've, it's not like you've just waltzed into med school. <laughs> There's the doors open. They're like, oh, do you want to do, do you want to become a doctor here? Just come through. Like I worked my ass off in my degree. You know, I did it on by my son's hospital bed and, and, you know, or and with kids or if you've done it and you've struggled financially, but you've stuck it out um, and you've got the grades, you know, they don't just let any, anyone into medicine um so yeah and then I think of that and I think nah so it just has to get out of your head because it can really affect you Tim like it on placement sometimes I just leave and I think what am I doing I've never thought about quitting I've always thought about can I change my placement if it's someone that's actually um making you feel like that because I don't think it's fair I mean the whole purpose of placement is to learn and to learn like and to, to get to know your patients and to consolidate all of your knowledge from the first two years, it shouldn't be a, a place where you're made to feel like you don't belong in the course. Yeah. So just remind yourself of why you're there, um, who you're doing it for, whether it be yourself, your family. For me, it's my whole family. <laughs> like as in like my aunties and uncles are all so excited um, to see me, you know, finishing and stuff. Um, but yeah, just not, just don't let that bother you because that's also taking away your mental space to, to study and learn um, the purpose why you're um, on placement in the first place. And when I was going through it, I had a pretty terrible experience in third year last year, but I thought, you know what, I'm just going to 
use the channels that I need to. I'm going to, I don't know if I contacted Marie. I definitely let Kelly know. Um, and I just end up, and I said, yep, yeah, I'll be the student rep. Any issues come through, you know, just send them to me. And I put my name up because I was having a whole, this is in GP land. And then the other students, they were having issues too. So then, and everything, I just sent it all up to to the um, to Emma or whoever, and I just said, "Yep, yeah, I'm the student rep here. These are the issues. This is, yeah, you know, and not wording it, um, yeah, like wording it professionally, but it was just to say this is not acceptable. Like we're students, we're learning, um, yeah, and I think just going through those channels and stuff, and then saying, right, get it, move on, you know." Um, that's an experience. You're going to get that in med school. Um, probably other health fields, nursing. I heard that nursing can be quite um, challenging as well with things like imposter syndrome. But um, yeah, never ever uh, make that your, yeah, don't let it affect you when you're learning. Yeah. At the end of the day, that's the most important thing. Yeah, expanding our knowledge. Like I would love to, for other Indigenous folk, young, old, you know, families or whatever, or no families to to get in and get educated. Like it's, yeah, life-changing, so rewarding, it's the best, yeah. Marie, has this been something, that it's certainly something that, that probably has come across at your desk from time to time, the, the issues of imposter syndrome, um, concerns about alternative perceptions of alternative pathways is that something that props up for, from time to time yeah it, it does Tim and I think it's really important um, that our staff especially the Aboriginal staff that you know are there and are able to have conversations with the students so that um, students can access um their lecturers but on the other hand you know we don't sometimes teach the students so our role here is is just to support and guide and you know uh uncle richie and auntie pat you know our elders on campus they're they're really important to provide that cultural guidance as well um and to make sure that our students are actually feeling culturally safe. So if there are issues of racism that, you know, those, those conversations can be had um, and that, you know, most importantly that, you know, we're in the business of making sure that it's about students first, you know. So, um, you know, I think it's, it's absolutely critical that there are more and more Aboriginal staff and academics that are there to not just teach but to be accessible so we're part of a um, whole ecosystem to support those students you know from from being the first responders to then also being someone to talk to you know um, as a friend as a mentor so as staff we we straddle all of that you know but because the needs are, are, are different as well and I guess that's one of the important things about hearing a story like Carly's is that it, these experiences, the good and the bad, we need to learn from them as we're developing pathways coming through because they're, uh, they're, they're not heavily trodden pathways yet, are they? They're, there's not many people that have gone before you, Carly, and, and hopefully you're uh, you know, at the vanguard of, of bringing further people along as you tell pe excite people about science. But... Um, but I guess that's one of the important things is to try and learn from some of these experiences. Oh, yeah, definitely. And I think, um, yeah, I think that, uh, which is why I was, I'm, I'm pretty keen to, to have, to start like an alumni group. I mean, we do have an Indigenous med mob group here, um, but everyone gets so busy uh, and a lot, a lot of, them are doctors so which is fair enough um and we have like a Facebook chat and things like that but I think having like one that's dedicated to Flinders that has direct access access to medical students um coming through so we can share our experiences and be um you know and give them some insight if they're experiencing anything any challenges similar to what we have um yeah and to be their support 
because we didn't have that and I think that makes a difference and it's only sort of in this last in my last year that I've actually um formed some connections with like some of the Indigenous doctors here um because I can be quite shy um and a bit of an introvert so yeah but a couple of them have come up to me and like started chatting and then I was like, wow, how good would that be and feel as a student when you first started at Flinders and then having an actual group? I mean, definitely sign me up. I think Sarita's pretty keen as well um, to, to be able to, yeah, give some advice and um, support to the students. Mm. The, the next one's coming through, yeah. Uh, how, um, uh, one of the things that you this that you've painted through through telling us your story is the challenges of moving from that first step, be jumping into study. How will I cope? Uh, what do you think we need to do to? Uh, we have some pathways, of course, but lots of people are, are just thinking it's all too hard. Uh, how do you get across that? Um, I think contacting. So most of the unis now thankfully have like an indigenous support um center attached to them and so i would probably i'd recommend contacting them although to be honest sometimes they haven't been that helpful um but even just saying look if you can't help me can you point me in the direction of someone that can um because i think yeah taking that like cause for me it was really hard i remember i couldn't even find out anything really about the degree i just and then they weren't um, oh, we had Ani Betty our kit at, there at the time, and she she was really really good, and she sort of helped me with the SATAC and all those little things like applying through because we have to apply through SATAC for CDU and things, and like even this those little hoops sometimes that can be a deterrent straight up for a student like oh no nah, we've got to apply through Adelaide oh and feel overwhelmed but it's like no you can get funding it's like I think it's like a hundred dollars if you've got a cert for you know you can use that to apply and see if you can get into your degree and things like that I think um for people that are wanting to take that plunge into to study would be to contact a support um office or um I don't know if they have maybe like an indigenous student um group in general for like all of the unis like I don't know if there's any anything based in Darwin I've been in my little med school bubble for too long now um but yeah so I was going to ask Marie actually if there is something like that so any any mob that want to study here um can contact is there like a main hub because I know CDU is has one but they're not the only uni as well Tim so sometimes I think some of the degrees like if people and like another thing is people financially may not be able to study full time. Um, I couldn't, that's why I waited till I was 30. It was the first time I'd actually gone on paid mat leave. Um, so people might wanna do external degrees. So there's other unis around Australia. Um, so yeah, it would be interesting to, to see if there is a main, I'm not sure Marie, if there is something in Darwin for people to, to contact and get some information and advice on how to start. I'm not mm -hmm. sure. I think you met when you mentioned um, like an Indigenous centre um, at Flinders, it's always been uh, Yungarinthi and they've been based in Adelaide, but that, that's going to be changing. So, you know, Yungarinthi is going to be having their outreach up in Darwin as well. Um, and specifically, oh, okay. yes, that's changing. So, oh wow, um, we're 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 definitely in the com the throes of a conversation at the moment. So, um, Kelly Ann is is our support person on the ground up here for community engagement, but yeah. that's going to be broadened as well. And um, Yonkarinthi, um, led by Professor Simone Tua, um, they're certainly looking at um, having staff based up in Darwin. So that's yeah. going. To Changing. So that that's going to be a big shift from, you know, from you've been there for four years, you know, I've seen you grow from strength to strength. Um, and, you know, I think the most important thing is that students can know who to go to. And I think it's really important that there's someone oh, definitely. personally on campus that can actually field those questions, whether it's from scholarships to rental assistance. Well, is oh okay because Kelly and that was another thing another feedback was going to be um because we weren't sure who was who when we first started at Flinders like I didn't know what your role was I knew that you were mob I knew that you were like staff in some capacity of support um and uh, like I knew Kellyanne from the application process 
Um, but yeah, like we didn't know who was who. So that would have been good to get a bit of an intro and stuff when we started. Unless we didn't, I missed it. But yeah. Um, but yeah, but that's for med school um, and the courses that Flinders offer. Yeah. Um, and I was thinking like maybe someone that can feed, feed through um, just to make the options, yeah, to create more options and stuff for, for tertiary studies for our mob. Yeah, and I think the PMP is really important for that first port of call, you know, as the students and um, yourself and others come in and interface with the with the university. Um, that's that's absolutely a critical point, you know. Um, but it's the support over the four year program, which is you know. Uh, about completion. So what is it actually going to take for uh, a student to get through? Um, so, you know, it's a case by case, you know, scenario. And that's how we need to approach it because the students needs are, are very different. Um, but certainly the PMP is, is the entry point for, for all those conversations to be had. And, um, you know, I would see that as um, really critical also, um, we would like to see that there would be more cultural immersion too. So for our non-Indigenous students that are coming in at that first point, you know, really critical for, for them to be able to um, understand what the, the, the local context is like and, and is there an opportunity to do cultural immersion as part of the, the uh, induction into the program. So that's the other side of it as oh, well. Oh, that would be so good, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's about meeting the needs of our um, Indigenous mob that are coming through. But we also know, and we've seen this over the years too, Carla, we, we you know, uh, we want to be able to have our non-Indigenous students have, you know, those opportunities as well, because um, we don't want division. We, we want those cohorts to be together and, and finish together. Um, and, and, you know, we need to see that that there are opportunities for non-Indigenous students to, to engage, you know. Yeah, and I think it's important as well because look at how our patient cohort here. Yeah. Um, it's, I, I, did, I just did my audit and, I, and out of like a group of um, patients, 68% were Indigenous. And I'm like, that is unreal. Like patients that had, yeah, um, suffered cardiac arrests and yeah it would be yes, definitely definitely um, important that the students have a, a like so where it's more culturally safe mm -hmm. for not just us as other students but for the patients as well and, and I think a, a change that has occurred this year too Carly is that um, you know some of our strategies our key strategies such as the RAP you know we were able to engage um, students this time around for the refresh and yourself and others have also been involved in the Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander Health Plan. So um, more and more there's opportunities for us to hear the voices of students, not just to assume what the issues are. And I suppose, you know, um, what I've been able to hear is that, um, you know, yourselves coming through, you're so busy doing your course, but what are the opportunities to be able to do professional development and how do us as academics um, try and enable that um, in terms of scheduling of lectures? How do you know, students are able to go out and, and have that professional development um, but still be able to sit their exams and do their course at the same time? So these are the kinds of conversations that I heard this, this year which were really quite refreshing. So, and there is that appetite to have um, professional development as part of, of your degree. So, you know, um, I think that was something that, you know, we, we all need to... Um, pay attention to uh, because at the end of the day um, you know when you step out in in the next month or two you're going to be part of the community so yeah um, that's how right. do we make that transition from you know yourself as students and then moving into into the community you know yeah yeah that, that that's probably a great place to um a, a great final point to really look at you're you're on the verge of finishing time as a student after many years of study, Carly, you're, have you got any visual picture of what that end point is going to be like? Are there 
champagne corks and family standing around or is there sort of a quiet moment of solitude saying thank goodness it's done uh is they singing for graduation yeah um yes yeah, so, <laughs> so graduation i'm planning i've actually asked for some help through the uni for my family to come over they want to come over and dance at graduation and then while they're here we want to have a big party afterwards because we're not having a dinner there's no uni dinner so I was thinking um, uh, we've organised a couple of events with the students that week, but if my family do come over, we're going to have a big celebration and probably do some more um, dancing and culture. Um, yeah, which would be fantastic. Yeah. And, and just one more point, Carly, um, what would your advice be for uh, our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students coming into the program? What would your, you know, three, three points of advice be? Um, three points. Okay, the first one, don't give up. Um, and if you feel that uh, at that point, talk to someone because we've all been there and felt that um, and it can really help. Um, two, always remember why you've enrolled in the course. Think of your end goal, your end dream, not the student sitting next to you, not the doctor, you know, maybe saying something that you think is inappropriate always have that in the back of your mind and that you deserve to be there um and my third point would be um to to think about what you're studying and just um and just really um uh, really like involve um uh, immerse yourself in to medicine because it is such a, an amazing thing, just a field to study. Um, and I think putting all of these challenges and everything out of our minds, when you think about it, you think, wow, I'm actually studying medicine. Like I'm studying one of the hardest things you can do and it's real and you're in it. So yeah, so don't give up and yeah, and talk and reach out, I think. But there was one more point that I had on my list if I could just add to it. Yes, um, please do. So uh, was the tutoring. So I know that Flinders and Yongarinji have the tutoring program. Um, so yeah, so definitely use the hours. I never did. I was like, because you get so busy, but Sarita's got kids as well. And she's always scheduling in her tutoring and her free, you know, when she can. And I just never did that, Tim. And I was like, oh, and it's there. Like, use it, use it, to take advantage of that. Because when I have actually reached out to doctors, um yeah it has been amazing as in doctors or other tutors but normally third and fourth year you'd be getting tutored by a junior doctor and that has made such a difference and I just kick myself like I should have done that um throughout the whole degree so definitely get into tutoring it is there to help um I think it would also it, it would have helped with a lot of the other um challenges that I had when I started out if I had got the you uh, used all the hours and stuff yeah fantastic well thank you carly thank you marie thank That's you thanks for inviting exciting me exciting and inspirational story i can't wait to uh, uh hear the uh, and see the pictures when you graduate it'll be awesome great yeah. celebration yeah awesome thanks tim thanks marie thanks very much see you Bye.